Hello, good evening, and welcome to this Lard in Action special. And a very special welcome to our live audience here on YouTube. We hope that you'll be able to participate and interact with us. Uh, we've got a pretty full agenda uh, with questions asked already in advance relating to the new Two Fat Lardies rule set, Infamy. Infamy. Uh, so we need to crack on. And I have to say that I'm no different to the rest of you watching. Yes, you are. I'm, to find out. <laughs> I'm no different to anyone else in wanting to find out more about Infamy. Infamy. So joining me this evening is Richard Clark, my good chum, the game designer. Richard, welcome. Thank you, Sydney. It's a pleasure to be here. And hello to everybody who's uh, joining us. Hello, Carol over there in Bristol. Hello, Paul over there in Evesham. But hello, everybody. Can't go through you all. Over in Norway, uh, eccentric man in St. Evanage, Mr. Hobbs in the Valleys. Hello, Sid. Uh, it's great to see everyone coming. What I'm keen to do in the programme is to gain an understanding from you, Richard, uh, from what people can expect from infamy. Uh, so not really just the specifics of the rules, but a bigger picture, especially to start off with, to give us a feel for what kind of gaming experience uh, everyone can look forward to. Uh, and a good place to start is probably right at the very beginning. Uh, can you tell us in a couple of sentences what Infamy is? Yeah, well, that is the very beginning. Infamy, Infamy is a large skirmish rule set specifically for the wars um, between Rome and their Western barbarian neighbours between 60 BC and AD 100. So that covers Caesar's campaign in Gaul, uh, his two invasions of Britain, his fights against the Belgae, the Germans crossing the Rhine, so the Swaby, uh, the Sicambri, and others, the Helvetii. It covers the conquest of Britain under Claudius, um, the campaigns of Suetonius Paulinus against Boudicca. It covers Agricola fighting all the way up past Inverness uh, to um, uh, try and conquer the whole of uh, this island. Arminius in the German forests against Varus's legions, the Batavian revolt of AD, AD 69. Um, you'll be able to fight other actions such as Roman civil wars, uh, AD 69 being case in point, uh, the year of the four emperors. Uh, but actually, the Romans versus Romans with Pompey and Caesar will be uh, also covered in more detail, much more detail, in the first add on which will cover the Mediterranean Rim with Carthage, Greece, Numidia, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, uh, so the Lusitanians and the Celto-Iberians. Uh, but that's something to look forward to. So that's where we are. That sounds great. And I'm getting from that already the idea that Rome versus the barbarians is the big theme, the big picture um, yeah. set of rules. But let's be honest, I mean, there's quite a lot of War Games rules out there covering that ancient period so what's the unique selling point that you're trying to bring across with infamy okay um well i think the first key is they're large skirmishes rather than battles um it's interesting when you read the histories of uh, the ancient romans is the romans were extraordinarily successful at winning the key big battles that counted um uh, and you know once they get the right number of people and they can get secure flanks the, the roman army is a devastating and hugely impressive um uh, mincing machine. I hate to mention mincing with you around, Sid, but um, it, uh, uh, it's when you look at the skirmishes, the smaller skirmishes that you read about the barbarians winning. So you get the column of troops sent to try and help uh, help the uh, the Roman um, colonists in uh, in Colchester, Camilodunum, who were completely cut up in the woods by the Iceni and the Trinovantes. So it's those small actions where I think there's much more balance, um, where it's a harder fight for both sides. But it also allows us to examine what's happening in detail. I think a lot of us will have read not just historical uh, texts, but you know works uh, uh, by writers like Simon Scarrow um, and Harry Sidebottom, who are themselves you know, academics in their own right. But when you read their books, they go into a lot of detail in terms of the drill of the way troops fought. You know, people start firing arrows at them. They're able to put their shields up to counter that, as we know that the Romans did. Um, you know, they've got to make decisions about when to go into close order. They've got to make decisions about when to uh, go out swinging, if you like, with uh, in more open order. And 
This allows us, playing large skirmishers, to have a game where the basic unit is a unit. It's not an individual man. It's not that type of a skirmish. So it allows us to set our magnifying glass to a level where we're able to see the detail of what is happening at that level. And it's not just a case of having Romans who get a plus two and better morale. It's because they do have pillar and they do have you know, the scutum, and they do have their drill. We're actually able to see what that drill does and how that differentiates their fighting abilities and fighting methods from the barbarian. So it's ancient, Jim, but not as we know it. Different feel. Somebody in the playtest play group said to me, it felt like the heart of darkness. When you go into the barbarian territory with the Romans, you are scared. Well, Good. Uh, that, that's what we read about, and that's uh, precisely uh, what we want to uh, want to see happen. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to move on with infamy because Robin uh, Youngerspund asks a question, which I think a lot of people are going to want the answer to. Uh, Robin asks, um, and I'm going to try and paraphrase what was a pretty long, uh, detailed post by him. How have you found Richard researching for skirmish scale ancient conflict? Um, often it seems that, you know, Senso commander took 200 light troops to secure the hill, and that was really it. And Robin went on to say, it feels that ancients have a particularly high hill to climb when it comes to skirmishes, because other rules uh, for war games are, are really like canae light, canae but smaller. And the issue that Robin particularly struggles with is a complete lack of evidence for the smaller tactical units uh, of less than 100 men. Um, and he doesn't really see any evidence of how they were used in any independent fashion. Um, but there must have been conflicts involving 30 or so people on either side, such as ambushing a travelling legate or a farmstead raise or a palace coup or a forlorn hope going through the breach of an ancient wall at Alicia. Um, and nobody would be saying, well, hang on a minute, I haven't invented the platoon yet, so I can't work out small unit tactics. And I think what Robin's really trying to say is, you know, what are the sources that you're going to be using for this level of fighting. Because let's face it, most of the ancients are really writing about decisions at their own level. And for what we know, skirmishes would have been so common that nobody's really written on them in great amounts of detail. Um, so does the fact that there's no ready-made tactical unit make your job as a rules designer harder? Now, my apologies for Robin for paraphrasing that, but I think what he says gets to the nub of the matter. Uh, mm -hmm. What he's really saying is infamy, infamy, given that sourcing, um, of information and evidence is less of the skirmish actions. Is infamy infamy just a glorified fantasy game? <laughs> okay, well, that's direct and to the point. I like that. Um, okay, well, I, you know, I wouldn't disagree with him entirely, but I would disagree with him in some matters of substance. You know, World War Two, let's take, has got loads of written sources. You know, so I can, you know, I can not only. Uh, you know, research a war or research a battle, I can research, you know, a tiny skirmish. I'm likely to find two or three books on, you know, the most obscure action that happens. Um, so it's brilliant. You know, we, we go books, 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 and we've kind of got it all covered. Ancients is different. Books are limited. The written, written word is limited, but they're not absent. You've got Polybius, the Greek, who's a great source because he's not writing some kind of um, uh, sales and marketing brochure like Caesar uh, often did, which were highlighting his skills. This is a guy who's analysing how the Romans beat them during the, the period of the, the Republic. But then you have got Caesar, you've got Livy, you've got Vegetius, you've got Tac Tacitus, you've got Varro, you've got Josephus. You know, there are lots of names that we know who tell us lots of information. So they tell us about the pillar, they tell us about how Marius changed that, they tell us about the scutum, they tell us about the gladius, how they you know, brought the idea of that from Spain. Uh, Polybius and Varro both describe the, the styles of armour, so we know about the chain mail, we know about the segmented armour. So we've got a good picture of the kit uh, that they use. And these weapons are pretty much constant across the period, certainly 200 BC to 200 AD. And that suggests that while reforms took, pl uh, took place, such as the move from the manipular system to the cohorts, the tactics at the bottom end remained the same. Basically, the infantrymen were doing the same thing with the same bit of kit. Um, you know, we've even, got, we've even got reference material on the fighting frontage per man. We know that um, 
When the Romans were in open order, it was twice the space of the space of a Greek spear or pike armed unit. We know that they fought in both open and close order because there are you know tales of them closing ranks and presenting effectively a shield wall. Uh, we know they used their pillar to disrupt the enemy. We know that they didn't just use a sword to stab. You know, there's there's not only many a, a accounts of them using wide swinging motions, but also lots of accounts of severed limbs. Now, if you're simply using a stabbing uh, a stabbing method, you are not going to get limbs being hacked off, which suggests that when the Romans are going in open order, their style is much more swinging and slashing, cutting. So skirmishes are remarked on the idea that they don't mention them isn't true i i um you know as part of my research i you know went through in very fine detail in caesar's gallic wars there, there's over a dozen references specifically to skirmishes and not references to a dozen skirmishes i mean caesar says um at all times he kept his army in camp but engaged daily in cavalry skirmishes um, there's another quote, and on the first arrival of our army, they made frequent sallies from the town and contended with our men in trifling skirmishes. That's not just one skirmish, that's lots of them. Daily skirmishes take place continually in view of both camps. These were fought at the ford and the pass on the morass. But it's, that's where skirmishes are going to take place, where armies are coming into contact. Now, Caesar actually talks about continual uh, skirmishes. And in fact, if you look at the war in Gaul, one of the things that Caesar talks about constantly is forage. And really, it's a war of logistics. When he comes up against Vercingetorix, the Gauls decide to use a scorch earth policy because what they're trying to do is starve out the Romans. So it's constantly about um, skirmishes in that type of warfare. Caesar is having cartloads of grain sent back to his army. You know, somebody is escorting them and somebody is attacking them. When Caesar lands in Britain in 55 AD, he sends his legions, his legionaries specifically, not to lighter troops, out to local farms to collect grain. Um, what's the quote? Caesar had sent three legions and all the cavalry with Trebonius for the purpose of foraging, and the Britons flew upon the foragers suddenly from all quarters. So there's lots of references to skirmishing, but I'd agree they don't go into full tactical detail. But to be honest with you, do we need full tactical detail? We can look at the weapons that troops use in World War II and draw a lot of conclusions from just simply looking at the weapons without having the manuals that we've got for World War II. But we've also got those manuals, or some of the manuals, surviving from the ancient period. But we can supplement that because unlike World War II, we don't have unlimited shelves full of books like we've got here. It's, the amounts are pretty limited. But we look at archaeology. So you look at things like the Corbridge Hoard, you look at the Scutum that was discovered in Egypt at uh, Qasar al-Harit, which is almost perfectly preserved there. You've got the Necropolis at uh, Monte Fortino, which is, uh, you know, you've got a large amount of equipment that's coming there. Now, all of that provides evidence for how the Romans were equipped. And we can cross-reference that back to the writings uh, of those classical uh, writers. But we've also got visual representation. Now, you think about, you know, you go up to a museum on Hadrian's Wall, there's lots of tombstones there which show us how people were dressed. It gives some indication of their equipment. But that's minuscule compared to thing like, things like uh, the Cenotaph of, of the Julii or the Pigna Monument or the Adam Cleese Monument in Romania, which is spectacular in terms of the detail. And bear in mind that this is produced in very much a frontier area. So a lot of the Romans who are going to be there are going to be soldiers or colonists who've been soldiers and have been granted land in that area. And if you put up some kind of dodgy comic book interpretation of war, they're going to go, it ain't bleeding like that, mate. It's, it's like this. But again, Trajan's column. The large number of people in Rome who who would have had cert military service, the Guerrero uh, de Stepa in Seville, the Mines Principia, the column of Marcus Aurelius, uh, the altar of um, Domitian Ahenobarbus, the column of Antonius Pius, they all give visual representations of the Roman army at war. And they are all designed to be, funnily enough, talking about comic strips, they're all designed to be telling a narrative which the reader can look at. So they do. The story speaks to us. And we can take all of this and put it in a blender. And you can add things like the Roman military oath, which allowed troops to leave their formation to retrieve missiles. 
um, or to rescue fellow citizens. Now, it's interesting that when we think of an oath of loyalty, we think of an oath to the queen, uh, an oath of, to the country. But in the Roman oath, it's not just about loyalty and, you know, I promise I will do my best to do my duty to God and to the Queen. It's, um, it's about military discipline. They go into that detail. And you look at the story of Cato the Elder, who whipped a soldier personally who broke ranks. But he wasn't breaking ranks to run away. It was in his eagerness to get at the enemy. And Manilus, the, the, in the early Republic, uh, who uh, had his own son executed for breaking ranks. His son was being riled by some Latin tribesmen who were goading him, and he rushed down, chopped their heads off and nicked their wallets, and went back to his dad and said, look at, look at this, I've got all this, all their cash and credit cards and whatever. And his father said, no, I'm not having any of that. I told you, discipline. And he, he had him executed, which seems a bit extreme. I mean, that could be hagiography, because um, Manilus uh, was very well known as Topar, because of his the way he fought an ancient Gaul in I think it was the third century BC and he seized his metal torque which was a badge of uh, uh, you know great power and uh, great deeds so it could be hagiography but it certainly gives us an insight into, into the Roman mind so uh, and that's all about discipline so I would refute the idea that there's no information I'd accept the fact that the information takes some finding, but in terms of developing and um, uh, a set of rules, it's, that's my job to go through that and, and not just read Big Book of Romans and Asterix, but to look at the academic papers and, and read through them and make decisions based on what I think um, was happening. I mean, there's a, there's and as for the barbarians, well, the Romans... Hmm. Sorry, mate. There's a lot of groundwork which has gone into that. And I sometimes think when you think about mm. things we've done before, mm. like Dex Britanniarum um, mm. in the early medieval period, the lack yeah. of sources isn't always a disadvantage because it really forces you to think harder about the sources you do have to try and interrelate yeah. those sources and to fill in some of the gaps. And it very much seems that that's what you've been doing. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, because the research that I did on Dax Britanniarum provided me with a bit of a route map uh, for doing this, because it does make you realise you're going to have to look at other sources. Uh, and, you know, it's, so, for example, you know, when looking at the barbarians, the Romans wrote a lot about the barbarians because they were obsessed with them because basically they were bloody scared to death of them so they leave, leave us quite a few interesting accounts of how they fought and again you've got the archaeology you've got grave goods you've got votive offerings in swamps and bogs or wherever you know these people chuck their old stuff um and you you have to think about using that information uh, 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 to to try and fill in the gaps. Every piece of information you can get is a small scrap of patchwork, and then you sew it all together. And there are going to be some gaps missing, as there were with Dutch Britanniarum. But the important thing is that um, the important thing is that you the fewer gaps you have, the easier it is to fill in those gaps because you're not just, it's not total guesswork, it's based on the structure that is around that. And actually that's been fairly um, minimal. One of the things that historians always say is absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And they have to say that as a historian. But as a game designer, you actually have to turn that on its head and say, if there isn't evidence for it, then I can't put it in the rules. Um, otherwise, you know, you might as well have your ancient Britons armed with cricket bats because there's, there's, you know, the the absence of evidence of cricket bats doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, it just means you might not have found any. So you, you by by taking the information you have and building uh, the rules around that, it's um, uh, uh, it certainly allows you to make informed decision. Derek's asking about Virtus, you know, the the very uh, the very Roman. Um, a concept of military virtue, uh, virtue and discipline, which was nearly the name of the rules until somebody pointed out it was VD. Um, and then somebody said discipline and virtue, and that somebody pointed out that was diarrhea and vomiting. So in the end, infamy, infamy, warm. Um, but um, it, uh, yeah, it, I, I would disagree that there's an, a total lack of information. There is a total lack of information about how units were structured, but I don't think the Romans ever had any problem in forming little battle group, camp groups, call them what you will, um, uh, and going off and doing specific tasks. So one thing I'm going to develop from mm. that thought mm. is that you've got sources uh, for both 
the Roman side and the opposing side, some barbarians, mm. some Gallic, some, well, who knows in the future, we'll come on to that later. You've got different sorts of sources which are available. You've got different visual sources. You've got different cultural sources. Mm. You've also, I think, already sort of mentioned that you were interested in the asymmetrical aspect of warfare, uh, yeah. which I think helps when you're thinking about the different sources available for the different sides. But one of the things which I want to just explore with you, which I thought was very interesting, is a potential different way in which the two sides fight. So in a way, perhaps the difference in the sources and the evidence mm -hmm. reinforcing some of the aspects in the game rules that you're trying to bring out in the way that the two sides fight. Yeah, I, I think that, that's very true. And it's interesting. It was an interesting experience in having to throw away preconceived ideas because, um, <coughs> excuse me, one, one, one has this idea fixed in mind that the Romans are, are effectively like a, a, a slow-moving steamroller that destroys everything before them with, with shields to the fore and short stabs through. And in fact, when you actually do the research, you discover that, yes, that is a, a, one of the weapons that they have in their arsenal, but um, uh, they certainly were capable of coming out and swinging their, uh, their shields and, and swords with the best barbarian. And you realise that the, the reason that the Romans put so much importance on military discipline is that the veneer of civilization is incredibly thin. Um, and the difference between the two sides is about who can um, who can play their own game the best and get the enemy uh, to uh, get their enemy to fight their way. So, so I mean, I, I first read about Caesar's Gallic Wars when I was seven years old at school, but that unfortunately was in Latin. But nevertheless, it was interesting. Um, but it even seemed to me then that it was not a war about two nation states fighting each other, as you would get, you know, in a war between the Napoleonic Wars between France and Britain. So this was a war between very, very different cultures. And this results in very different fighting styles. So when Caesar arrives in Britain in 55 BC, you have a heroic style of warfare that he finds. You have individual warfares, uh, sorry, warriors. They're driving up on their chariots and they're trying to pick out the people who they think, look, have a similar social status to them. So the Roman sub-chief will go, oh, that centurion's got a pretty hat. He must be a noble fellow like me. I'm going to have, um, uh, you know, mano a mano combat with him. And, of course, the Romans are having none of that. So um, you see uh, that total difference in, um, uh, you know, in mindset and attitude. And um, they uh, that, that's something that had to, to come to the fore uh, in the rules. And that's very much, you know, to talk not so much about history, but game mechanisms. The Romans have discipline and drill. And it's that system allows them to use their points of drill at key moments. So they, they're a lot more tactically nimble. They can react to threats. They can put their shields up, as I keep saying. They can brace their shields. They can move into close order to absorb the, the initial impact of the barbarian charge. And then, when the moment's right, they dissipated the enemy's fervour and fury. They can burst out in open order and go in, swinging their swords in, you know, in tremendously aggressive and fast-moving attack. Um, but, nevertheless, you know, the terrain belongs to Charlie. Um, uh, the barbarians... Uh, when they're operating in their own country, are really uh, scary for the Romans. Um, they have to decide when to attack and when to stay hidden. Uh, the, the last thing I wanted was a, a, a classic war game where I line up my figures on one side of the table and you line yours up on the other side. And what we then do is move to contact and have a dice rolling competition as we move down the, uh, move down the line. Uh, because that's the type of game that I played many years ago and that completely put me off Ancients. In fact, if you just said to me two years ago that I'd be developing a set of Ancients rules, I, I was still so scarred that I didn't want to do it, even though I had a great love of ancient Roman history um, uh, and always have done. Um, but it's a case of trying to develop a game where... Uh, you, the Romans got an incredibly powerful weapon in the legion, but they're not—they're likely to be outnumbered. They've got to protect their flanks. They can't allow their supporting troops to get too adventurous and be defeated in detail. 
So delivering a coherent attack and obliging the enemy to fight on your terms is is important for both sides. And I think that's that's good. And when those barbarians come down the hill, it's scary, and it should be. So that, that sounds really interesting. <clears throat> that's something which I think in a lot of ancient rules is possibly absent. Certainly the games that you and me played 20, maybe even 30 years ago, possibly even earlier than that, they didn't really have that dynamic. Um, so I suppose that's not a huge surprise, bearing in mind the rules that you know we've played before, the Lardy rules we've played before you've written and Nick's written. Um, focusing on the rules, trying to be true to the history, I think it's nothing new. I think what is interesting there is that you're trying to introduce the different mindsets of the belligerents to how they viewed war, hmm. uh, the different ways of fighting, if you like. Um, and that's very different to some rules which might have been based in the past on the, the actual weapons or even the actual tactics which the forces are fighting with. Um, mm. Did you think about that and as being a plus, uh, a benefit, when you were thinking about trying to persuade ancient gamers who might be more used to a big battle game, say, with 1,500-point competition armies uh, to, to entice them into playing Infamy? Was that a deliberate choice? Um, no, I didn't even think about it, to be honest with you. I um, I think one of the things that, as a company, that we've always been successful in doing is um, maybe presenting uh, periods to people who've never had the opportunity to play those periods before. Um, and so, consequently, I'm not looking to, you know, steal players from the, I don't know, WRG market, for, you know, without thinking of, of, you know, another name or thing. What I'm trying to do is to present a game that's interesting and challenging that will appeal to people who've got an interest in the history. Uh, and I think that um, by presenting a, set of, a game where the, you, the number of figures you require is relatively small and what I'd like to think of as sensible and achievable, you've got people who've got the opportunity to play ancients who've never uh, been able to do that before and also who um, maybe have played some of the games previously and, and haven't enjoyed it because they felt a bit too much of a dice fest, which ancients being combat-led uh, can often feel like. And that's that's something I wanted to avoid and I wanted to introduce elements into the game that made it a very, very a different but historical challenge. Very good. Well, we're going to take some of the questions which have been asked over the various groups and Facebook and uh, Twitter uh, just yeah. in a few moments. But a couple of good questions which have been coming up from uh, people on the chat, uh, because this is a live, live in action. Uh, mm -hmm. So one lovely question from our good friend, Derek Hodge, up in uh, Musselburgh. Pikes and elephants. Yeah. Uh, not normally seen in a skirmish, but is there going to be room in the rules for those types of tactical elements? I've no idea. I've got to do the research for the, the, the theatres where pikes and elephant, elephants become involved. Um, I, I'm not I'm not going to say off the top of my head, oh, yeah, this is great. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, you can definitely use pikes and definitely use elephants. I've really got to have a look at it and, and study those theatres in more detail. To be honest with you, one of the things I really want to do is read about um, all sorts of different conflicts at the moment, but I'm keeping very very focused because i don't want to be diverted from the primary task of getting this delivered and if i start reading about dacians which i did um, and if i start reading about carthaginians which i did and i suddenly thought hold on a minute i'm being pulled in too many different directions at once so i stayed very very focused i've got my copy of livy over there i'm very very keen to be reading that the punic wars and having a look at that but i'm not jumping the gun and uh, starting off um too early and as for Derek's choice of kebabs, which he seems to be li listing there, I haven't tried any of them. I normally just go for a shish or a donna. Very good. Uh, well, <coughs> I don't know about shishes or donners, mm -hmm. um, but Roger Ung yeah. asks, do you have any advice about the amount of the terrain that might be needed in a game of infamy? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, one of the things you'll find where you, um, when you're playing infamy, there is a complete terrain generation system, and we, we have used it steadfastly for every playtest game that we've had, whether we're fighting in Britain or Gaul or Belgium or Germany. Um, and it's uh, we've actually been really, really pleased, or, or, or um, you know, the Italian provinces, um, uh, Narbonensis, uh, you know, the more uh, Romanized uh, Gallic provinces. And that... Um, 
those systems are actually proved to be you know, tremendously effective in giving us terrain that really looks and feels like the area that we're fighting over. Um, and the key components, trees. If you're fighting in Germany, you're going to need an awful lot of trees. You might need six or even maybe seven square foot of them. Uh, to be honest with you, when you say a square foot, um, if you're, you know, <laughs> if the whole half of the table was covered in that, but that's highly unlikely to happen. Um, <clears throat> so maybe some of those, uh, you know, small forested areas are going to be slightly smaller than that. But you are going to need a lot of trees if you're fighting in, in Germany. You're going to need less trees if you're fighting in Gaul or Britain. Um, you're going to need hills. Um, maybe four uh, one foot square hills the way i've actually done mine is i've got two that butt up together so i can have a longer ridge um and i've got two individual ones and there's a potential a remote potential you might need a really big hill uh, about uh, two foot square but you can just add the other hills together for that uh, if you happen to roll up a mountain um i've rolled down a few mountains never up one um uh, you're also going to need things like uh, a bit of broken ground we're going to need things like um uh, marsh bog swamp call it what you will again there's a remote chance you might get a very large area that's a swamp but it's mainly marshes uh, so trees um marshy ground and um hills are the, the three main ones and a bit of habitation so you probably want, and when I say habitation, I mean something created by man. So that, that could be a little farm, but it could be a ploughed field or a, a, you know, a wheat field, because obviously we've talked about the importance of foraging in the period. So that's something that, um, uh, that, that you're going to need. There are some other bits and pieces you might need. So for one scenario, uh, there's a Limes Tower. War bases have made us a really nice one specifically for infamy, infamy. But if you've just got a little tower, it's um, a, it's a tower. It, um, but I, I like the, the one that war bases have done. It might be uh, in one scenario, you might need a, a small section of wall and a gateway. We would put this on the corner of a table. So as long as you can represent the gateway and a couple of sections of defended wall, uh, it's really that scenario is really about um, the attackers trying to breach the gateway and get get in. Um, so uh, the other stuff, well, uh, livestock because you're going to have raids for livestock. Things like carts, hay wagons. I don't know if you can see this. I'm just ooh, where are we? Just painting up a sort of load of hay on a wagon there. Uh, I'm doing another one with. Um, a different type of load of hay, um, just little things like that that could be escorted uh, through an area, maybe a pay chest, maybe a big barrel of wine on the back of a, a cart could be um, really good. Um, so that's the, that's the type of thing you, you know you, you don't you don't need anything particularly grand or clever. So one of the things which I think leading on from that physical terrain aspect, I think you've partly answered it already. Um, is the actual man-made terrain. And I know in a couple of the games, a couple of the posts, we featured Roman forts and hasty defences, I mean, really partly built by Paul Edwards at Sabotage, and they've been working yeah. very much, Paul. Um, are those scenario-based fortifications, are they going to be part of support options, maybe, um, in the rules? Yeah, there are support options, which are things like um, improvised defences or prepared defences, which uh, Sabotage have made for us. Uh, they've produced really high-quality 3D-printed models, um, and you can choose those defences. I mean, there are some scenarios that, uh, that will really appeal for that so for example one of the scenarios has got a roman engineering party which is with with their uh, with uh, their escorts which is being ambushed and it might well be that a couple of lengths of wall or whatever would help for that to be honest with you i built the forts just because i'm mental and thought that might be a fun project uh, i asked paul at sabotage to print me out a 3d battering ram and i did and then i converted some figures to be holding it and i thought Oh, now I've got a battering ram. I better have a gate. <laughs> so, uh, so I decided. I thought, if I've got a gate, I better have a wall. So I kind of went a bit mad and created uh, something that's a bit more than I needed. But I, I did it in a rough and ready fashion, so it could, uh, it could be the gate. Uh, so it could be a wall for a, a, a barbarian fort, just as much as a Roman one. Uh, but yeah, Paul does produce some really nice. Um, uh, prepared defences, which the Roman, a uh, uh, small Roman. For a uh, force like this 
could throw up overnight, you know, when you, you've got your uh, uh, stakes there defending the perimeter. So, yeah, they're, 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 they're in there as support options. Which So one of the things, I mean, we've dealt with terrain, we've dealt with yeah. sort of fortifications. What about movable fortifications? And in particular, I'm thinking of uh, Testudos. Uh, I know that that's something that you've been working on on Club Night, which we've been yeah. having over the last few weeks uh, yeah. virtually. And also on scorpions, I think. I mean, that's another mm. piece of, you know, partly mobile kit, if you like, which the, certainly the Romans would be able to deploy. A um, couple of very good questions coming. One from our mm. good friend Ralph asking about scorpions and the psychological effects of some of these weapons, which to a barbarian must have looked pretty terrifying. You know, they are at the top of the advanced scale of engineering, which they would have been encountering. So two slightly different points there, Testudo yeah. and also... Yeah, for want of a better word, artillery, I suppose. Well, testudo, you don't you don't need to make a testudo. There's a very nice testudo marker in the in the in the um, in the tokens kit, which uh, looks very pretty, and you can just put that by a unit and know it's in testudo. Again, I made one because I thought, oh, I've got a few figures left over. I might as well do that. And then they didn't work, so I bought some extra ones. So it kind of just became a crazy project that I would never, ever do again because my mind nearly exploded at several points. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you've got, in terms of uh, scorpions, I mean, you're talking about the Manu Ballista or the Caro Ballista, the Hand Ballista or the or the Cart Ballista. Um, I think I always believe that Manu and Caro refer to the means of transport. The idea of a lock and load with a handheld ballista strikes me as faintly ridiculous. But these are small pieces because this is really just a battle of, um, you know, skirmish forces. So we're not talking about huge onages or anything like that. These are these are small stuff. Um, and uh, psychological impact. Well, Ralph, not only psychological impact. Pat. The um, the scorpions have got a very fun mechanism that uh, if you shoot at one group, they they might potentially not just go through somebody in that group, but go through somebody in the group behind. So they're they're like a giant cocktail stick impaling your enemy, and yes, it does scare the whatever out of them. So the the, the, the psychological warfare is represented in that, and also the fact that it's a it's a monster piece of kit. Very good. So, I mean, on the other side of the fence, so to speak, um, or the wall, um, Caesar mentions a Gallic phalanx uh, yeah. in, in the Gallic Wars. Is that something that you feel about representing as well? So it's not just the Romans who have all the cool toys, if you like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's that, that's a, that is a, a tactical stance that the barbarians can adopt. We did think about using the term phalanx, but looking ahead, we know we're going to be doing the Greeks in the, in the first, um, uh, not so much supplement, and this is going to be the second part. It's because um, the, the whole infamy project is made up of three parts. Um, so um, we knew that the Greeks were going to be having phalanxes, so we called it a shield wall, um, <coughs> which according to um, the sources, it certainly looks like. The term shield wall, a lot of people get sniffy about that and say, oh, that shouldn't turn up until the fourth century. There's huge numbers of references to it that can be very easily translated as shield wall in the earlier period. And certainly it looks like a shield wall, a wall of spears to me. Not everybody can do it. So the Gauls are good at it because the Gauls are more developed. But the, for the Germans, for example, they're, they're only, their, only their elite warriors are going to be doing something like that. But yes, the, um, the shield wall is represented. So that tight body with presented spears uh, is definitely in there. Very good. So moving on from you know, mm. the items which are going to be deployed on the table, um, yeah. Adam Woodhead asked, uh, sorry, pardon me, Adam Woolhead asked yeah. um, about the actual scenarios in the book and sort of special terrain and miniatures you might be thinking about in a typical game relating to the sort of pickup game that you'd put down with your friends at home or maybe at a war games club. Uh, I think I saw something about road building going on on, on the Lard Island blog mm. and I think I know that on one of the oddcasts we talked about um, Celtic forts. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the scenarios and the blend of those in the book? Yeah, absolutely. The scenarios you can use just to pick a one-off scenario, roll the dice, away you go, get it. There are eight scenarios. Um, <clears throat> or it also ties in with the campaign system, which hopefully we'll get an opportunity to talk about. Um, it's... Uh, um, I've got a list of them somewhere. Hold on a minute. Um, so, 
you you could have all sorts of bits and pieces in here. Um, uh, so we've got a village raid, which is fairly obvious, and that could be the Romans conducting a raid into barbarian territory or the barbarians conducting a raid into Roman territory. We've got escort duty, um, which uh, could be about escorting a tribal princess to, to meet her new husband, or it could be about escorting a big cask of wine, uh, or it could be about... Um, well, escorting just about anything you can think about um, animals, uh, a mule train. Uh, so, you know, you might want, to, might want to create a mule train. You might want to get a couple of oxen, that type of thing. We've got on patrol, um, which is basically a patrol which is potentially going to encounter uh, some uh, opponents. You've got a foraging party, very much in the line of uh, Caesar, meeting a load of hairy barbarians jumping out the woodwork. We've got an engineering mission. You mentioned roads. It doesn't have to be roads. I mean, really, the engineers are there doing a task. So if you roll a, a, a table up that's got a, a river on it, well, how about they're you know, looking to survey the area for putting a bridge in? Or how about they're surveying the area for, for a road? Or how about they're building a road? It's whatever you want to make it look like. It could actually uh, be whatever you like. Um, so one, of the, one of the things which is which is coming through in the scenarios, and you talked about it in the uh, sources that you were looking at, yeah. is really that these games are partly about filling in the gaps, filling in the things which are perhaps missing in the longer accounts. You reference foraging, yeah. referenced ambushes, uh, the references which you get in the Agricola and Tacitus. Yeah. And so yeah. Do these incidents which are happening? So there's a real feeling here of the smaller war, the uh, campaigning aspect, and that comes through very, very strongly, I know, in what we've talked about it um, as well. So one of the things that I think Andrew France on the chat has asked about, and certainly mm. there's been people who have asked about it over the last couple of weeks, um, uh, including uh, John uh, Lopinski, I think. How are, you working, how are you thinking of working a campaign system into the rules, which might be similar to you know, what I think was a really great campaign system. I am biased, obviously, but I did really enjoy it and still enjoy it on Dux Britanniarum. Are you going to have a campaign system which is similar to that in infamy? Uh, yes, uh, although slightly different. So just to finish off the list of scenarios so everybody's got them, you've got engineering, you've got an attack on an outpost, which is where you need your limits tower. You've got a general engagement, which is where you just decide to have a punch up, and you've got an attack on the fortification. Now, you may notice the general engagement and the attack on the fortification are number seven and eight on a list of eight. So you won't normally get them uh, in your first games. In your first games, you're rolling a D6, and you're more likely to be getting that raid on a village or uh, escort duty or on patrol or a foraging party or an engineering mission or somebody attacking an outpost. Because that is the idea of the campaign. This is the Northwest frontier. This is the, the territory on the edge of civilization and the concept of boundaries is something, uh, and, and you know, international boundaries is something that, that is totally irrelevant to the to the barbarians and this is as true now uh, if you look at the you know porous boundary between uh, pakistan and afghanistan that we saw during the you know the war in afghanistan where things just flow across that without any hope and you go back to the 1920s and 30s and those borders are being treated in the same way you know the village raid escort duty on patrol foraging party engineering mission this is all classic boundary stuff so the way the campaign system works is you don't have a map. You can introduce maps. That's perfectly good. But the campaign system is mapless. And you roll the dice and you'll see what the scenario is that you're doing. Because basically, you are the centurion on the frontier in a dodgy little outpost. And your responsibility is to ensure the Pax Romana is maintained. And um, you are going to be uh, getting different missions. It's almost like the Sweeney. What are Reagan and Carter dealing with this week? Well, we've got a bloke who's done a sub post office. So the, the, the sub post office is, of course, um, Strepococcus or whatever the name of the barbarian is, raiding across and nicking somebody's cows. Uh, so the, the it's it's the, the the lot of a, a policeman on the border is not necessarily a, a happy one, but he has the opportunity to climb that wall of fame. You know, the Romans wrote on walls about their heroes. 
<coughs> they carve their names in, in the stonework. And the system allows you to develop a reputation in similar ways to developing a reputation in chain of command. But this reputation is written on the wall. And at the top, if you achieve it, is a, a, a uh, you you gain um, you know, a, a, a fabulous status as a famous uh, leader who's been hugely uh, successful, and you get your triumph. So you you, you have a triumph, and, and I, ideally that might be the end of your campaign or simply one chapter in it. At the bottom, if you go to the bottom, the last block that you'll ever get to is called infamy. You have become infamous for your horrific performance, and at that point in time, beware the Ides of March, the daggers are out and your campaign is over. And on the way, through this uh, fabulous uh, network of reputation building, you enhance your performance, you become a better commander, you become more likely to have information given to you by traitors and spies and blackguards and turncoats, all of whom are represented in the infamy deck, who can adjust the scales of uh, the, the, the balance of the game ever so slightly in your, in your favour. And you will also meet people who can join your retinue. Some of those people could be a senator in Rome who, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you're successful, uh, is shouting your corner for you. And it may just be one of those people is a slave trader who the money he generates for you, despicable character as he is, allows you to climb that ladder even quicker. So one of the things which is coming loud and clear really from just that brief description is that it's a mapless campaign. Yeah. And there are certain elements which can be introduced in there through yeah. uh, the success or failure of different forces. Yeah. Mark Leeson asked earlier in the chat uh, this evening, mm. um, how adaptable would this be as a set of rules for solo play? Now, Richard, the way that you're describing it does seem to me that this would be ideal as a solo campaign. I don't know if you've thought about that. I have been playing a solo game nearly every day um, uh, since uh, well, the last month because of lockdown. And uh, we, had, we did an odd cast about this, and I was kind of a bit dubious about solo games because I was an enforced solo gamer as a, as a youngster because I didn't know anybody who wore game. Um, and I, it wasn't the greatest experience of my life. However, we, you know, um, I went back to it with an open mind, and I really, really enjoyed it. And I think the way the card uh, system allows the flow of the game to be a surprise to the person running the game uh, as well as playing it means that you're constantly um, being faced with new and different and interesting challenges, and therefore... Um, you can uh, uh, play. it's ideal for solo play and I've, I've really enjoyed it I have really enjoyed it I have picked up a couple of ideas which I haven't put in the rules because I've got some ideas for solo play which I'm going to be writing in an article in um, LARP, the next edition of LARP magazine which uh, have come out of some of the conversations I've had with people which have been great fun so uh, yeah I, uh, I think it will be a great system and certainly the campaign system you'll be able to run that solo just as easily now I am very aware that some people will want to use um, create maps you can do that you can apply where's the raid you know you, you've got six villages on your map roll the dice uh, yeah. and, then, and then you've actually got real territory that you're you're fighting over and I think that will enhance it further but uh, you know, if you don't want to do that, what I wanted to do was to create a campaign system which was about the narrative. You've gone out there, you've completed your mission. Now, maybe you've been wounded. So maybe when the next mission comes along, you've got to make a decision. Do you go out and you're not fully healed or do you stay where you are? So there's, you know, there's a narrative story coming through in this. And maybe if you've met a medicus, you know, a Greek doctor, you know, maybe he's joined your retinue and that's going to allow you to heal a bit, um, a bit more carefully. So one of the things which is also coming out is the different characters are involved. I mean, you mentioned about the Medicus. You've yeah. mentioned also, I know we've talked about it before, about uh, Druids or Holy Men. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, other assorted people are probably hanging around Wales at the time. I mean, who knows? Um, but all, we, all over Britain. All over Britain. Because, of course, Wales didn't exist at the time. It was just Britain. Because it, it was all Wales. But wherever they are, whether it's Wales, Caledonia, or other parts of the British Isles, oh, yeah. Add-ons like musicians, standard bearers, um, yeah. other elements. I mean, Paul Andrew asked, I think, in the uh, post on Twitter, um, 
are all of these going to be possible to work into the game? And I think the answer from that, from what you're saying, Richard, is yes. I mean, they're either part of the support options or they may be part of the campaign benefits. Totally. Every um, every uh, force, be they Gauls or Britons or Romans or Germans, have got six characters who can join your retinue. They're not all likely to join you at once. Some of them might clear off if they think you're a bit of a whatever. Um, you're not doing so well. They might think, oh, I can go and find you know somebody nicer. Um, but yes, you uh, every one of them is going to have those uh, six characters who could join their retinue, and so there's lots of room. As I say, some of them will influence what's happening on the table, some of them will influence what's happening off the table, but still all have an influence on the uh, on the campaign. Still being with um, campaigns as well, I think uh, mm. I think uh, Aid asked, Aid Deacon asked on the chat, on the uh, live chat, a mm. uh, mm. question. I mean, like many people I've bought from you, uh, Jim Ibbotson's fantastic uh, yeah. painting map tiles for dawns and departures the yeah. sharp practice supplement uh, yeah. one of the things which i wanted to ask and i know aid was interested in this as well is are you planning something similar as regards infamy i truly hope so yeah i truly hope so i mean actually um <clears throat> there's going to be a lot uh, one of the first the, the next map tile set coming out is going to be for spain southern europe latin america and um <clears throat> It's very interesting when you go to places like Portugal, um, uh, you know, off the beaten track, that modern Spanish build, um, uh, Iberian buildings can look remarkably like Roman villas. I mean, I, I was up in northern Portugal a few years ago, uh, near the border with Galicia uh, and Spain, and uh, I was absolutely amazed. You know, you, you, even the even the the paint colours you could have been uh, on the film set of HBO uh, Rome series. So a lot of those tiles are going to be great for representing villas, farms, uh, and so on and so forth. But, yeah, we do really want to do an ancient set as well, which is going to have some very specific Roman buildings and also buildings for uh, the more local hairy barbarians. Well, talking about hairy barbarians, um, mm. on the other side of the... Mm. On the other side of the track from the Romans, barbarians have always sort of been a difficult thing to war game. I mean, war, uh, Romans, in some ways, are familiar because they are disciplined or should yeah. be disciplined. Yeah. And yeah. that's similar to what many of our thoughts are relating to bodies of troops moving on the table. So they look a little bit like a modern or early modern force progressing on the table. And they even have things like auxilia, and which broadly can equate to levy troops or less experienced legionaries and they have some sort of skirmish actions but barbarians are very different and i know one of the things that i wanted to talk to you about um was in detail things like well how do you deal with just the sheer unpredictability of some of the barbarian forces so you might think about um the equivalent of pictish or caledonian fanatics bursting out of a unit unpredictably um those types of gallic or um, Persian sort of forces which just don't conform to what we'd normally think of in a Roman type of war. Um, yeah. And certainly Bryce Pierce uh, on Twitter, I think, asked on the Facebook group or on Twitter, yeah. asked how, yeah. how, the, uh, how you're going to deal with that type of warfare, which is on the battlefield asymmetrical. Okay, what are we talking about? Uh, talking about naked lunatics specifically here, bursting out of troops. Well, I mean, I, I, I mentioned naked lunatics, but since you mentioned it, yes, possibly yes. All right, okay. Well, I mean, I uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, the naked fanatics um, often appear in you know many ancient rule sets as this sort of cohort of of uh, apparent sort of mental cases who've been kept in a cage and then stuffed full of magic mushrooms or get to fix his potions but they operate as a as a discrete individual unit of lunatics and <laughs> run at the enemy i don't actually perceive that to be like that the way i view it is not that you've got your trained pet loony although uh, um we have with nick um but i see these more as the most aggressive men in a mob intent on gaining honor uh, and this is what we we're talking about earlier about the the, uh, the the more heroic style of warfare that the barbarians um, aspired to and i should say i don't really like the term barbarian because it doesn't really do it but it's a nice 
a nice, um, easy tag to put on them, but maybe we'll come back to that. But <clears throat> what I see it as being is these are the enthusiastic mad guys incensed and keen to make a name for themselves, probably some of the younger guys who want to get in there first and have the honour of breaking the line and smashing into the, you know, the Roman thing and allowing their their um, colleagues, comrades, call them what you will, to come along behind them. So it, this ties in with the cultural emphasis on individual acts of valour. So the way it can work is that um, we allow a small group of these to proceed an attack by the main mob. And <clears throat> excuse me, they will rush in and fight, trying to create, trying to break up the Roman formation or disturb the Roman formation or shock, to use a lardy term, the Roman formation, which the mob behind them can then follow up on and gain an advantage. Now, if you get it right in terms of pitching it, th these crazy people who've rushed ahead will do the damage and the mob will then pile in immediately behind them. If, you know, it, like all these things, it can go off slightly to cock and the, the lunatics go streaming ahead and the rest go, look at those idiots, we'll, uh, we'll amble down and follow them up. But if you get it right, you're going to get that double whammy. And I think that's a far more believable view than the trained loonies who you get out and dose up on Getafix's uh, uh, potion. So that's that's how that specifically works. In terms of Barbarian. The term barbarian, it's very interesting because it's a catch-all phrase that the Romans use. It basically meant anybody who wasn't us or those Greeks who we think are a bit dodgy, but we accept they are civilised and we'll nick all their ideas. Um, so you look, at the, you look at the Gauls. The Gauls fight very differently to the Germans who fight very differently to the Britons um, because they are very, very different types of civilizations you know the, the britons are still using the chariots the gauls haven't used chariots for well maybe 200 years uh, um, certainly 150 years by the time that we're looking at here uh, and the, the, the gauls are a lot more using uh, the gauls have got a, 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 a society which is far more um, um uh, feudal almost if you like and uh, so you know the gallic nobles go into war with their stewards coming with them with remounts and more, uh, fresh javelins and a uh, you know, spare sword and a, a clean pair of Y-fronts or whatever is needed after five minutes hacking away at the Romans. So these are all represented in there, and, uh, 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 whereas, um, you know, the Germans simply don't have that. The Germans are much more, let's uh, let's get in and kick their heads in. Yeah, it's always nice to see some of those differences in warfare still being preserved and that the barbarians aren't just dealt with as a lump. Well, I don't, want them to be, I don't want them to be a sort of parody or a comedy. I want them to rep, I want them to represent, you know, a, 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 a burgeoning culture of its own. That uh, you know, the Germans, um, you know, fought very well. You know, the, the, the reason one of the reasons Caesar's in Gaul is because the Swabi have gone in there and are, uh, uh, and and are kicking the the backsides of the. The Gauls, who they originally went in there as mercenaries to assist, and they said, "Well, uh, now we're here. We're having some of your luxury countryside and lovely homes." But um, so it's you know these are not these are not just um, it's like the the Nazis in the war films who come around a corner going daka 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 and spraying bullets everywhere. That's a parody. It's not real. You've got to try and present something that is pertinent and reflects what 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 these people were doing. Uh, and in that same approach, are the barbarians, one of a better word, certainly the Gauls and the Germans, are they? Can, is it going to be possible in the campaign to play from their viewpoint? I mean, oh, yeah. yeah, 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 very much so. You win a turnip. <laughs> no, you don't win a turnip. <laughs> you, yes, you can. You can use the same thing. You can still become infamous. Even if you're, even if you're not Roman, and people will yeah, say Roman, Roman at the end of it. I mean, that's yeah. well, you could be. Yeah, that's right. Who knows? Who knows? Um, so, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, and I just want to pick uh, back to it. Yeah. Um, we've talked about terrain. We've talked about figures. We've talked about tactics. We've talked about the campaign. One of the things that um, I wanted just to go back to, and mm. sort of bringing things together as we draw the show to an end in about ten minutes. Mm. Um, is the fact that you're going to produce infamy in three parts um, <laughs> a, bit, a bit like Lord of the Rings, maybe? But well, come on, tell us more about which three parts they are. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, it wasn't actually a reference to Lord of the Rings, but never mind. So the first part is uh, Rome versus the hairy barbarians who aren't really barbarians. Uh, the next part is um, uh, going to be covering the uh, rim around the uh, Mediterranean. So we're going to have a look at Greeks. We're going to have a look at Carthage. Uh, we're going to have a look at the Iberian Peninsula, the uh, Celt-Iberians, the... Um, uh, Lusitanians, the Numidians in North Africa, um, and that's uh, so. That's also then going to cover things like uh, Caesar's uh, civil wars with Pompey, a lot of which was undertaken uh, in that area. And I was originally going to, because it covers the same time period as this, I was originally going to put it in the original book. But it becomes very, very obvious that Pompey's troops in Spain have been hugely influenced by the way the local troops fight. And that, that has influenced their tactics, and it needs to be covered separately in order to cover it in in the properly. In order to cover it properly, simple as that. That's good. That's good. And going forward from there, we talked about supplements. Are you also going to be planning to bring out material in the large specials or um, on the uh, blog from time to time? And obviously, I know that many people want to add their own slammed on some of the army's concern but yeah. have you got any plans or is it a bit early for that sort of thing um, well i'm very very keen to support it with um uh very very keen to support it with uh the um you know separate army lists that we can um uh, we can just produce different army lists for different things so for example the idea of producing forces for uh, ad 69 very very specific to um you know certain uh, be there Otho or Vitellius's troops, or you know, different forces for different emperors uh, during that year of the four emperors. I think would be really interesting. And of course, it, you know, there's there's almost no limit to some of the fun forces you can produce, but you clearly can't put them in the main rule book because they take up pages and pages and add to the add to the cost. And we we want to try and keep things um, uh, relatively um, you know cost effective for everybody. Is get a fix a support option. Well, Drew, it is, and if you want it to be Getafix, it can be, Andrew. Um, uh, but, yeah, so, um, yeah, it's certainly loads of lists that I'm really, really keen to do. Very good. So drawing things to sort of gather, I mean, one of the things I know we talked about a lot when writing rule developing scenarios, thinking about armies, about things that surprised you when you're actually producing the rules or writing the rules or that you were researching i mean you're a well-read guy a lot of the people on the chat equally well-read in many many ways but what surprised you about going to a period that although you knew about you probably haven't known in as much detail as you perhaps know now oh god no no absolutely um well i was amazed because um very much like the question you were asked earlier, how do you deal with it when there's no information there? I was amazed how much information there was. I mean, I knew we all know about Caesar's Gallic Wars and whatever, and we all know about Tacitus, but then you, you go further and you discover there's actually loads of information. Um, and you also realise that all the preconceived ideas you had about the short-stabbing Gladius are right, but they're also not the entire picture. Uh, and you, and you realise actually... Um, the reasons the Romans, the Gauls, um, called the Gauls barbarians was because they were scared of them because the barbarians had even sacked Rome. Um, apart from, and, uh, you know, the geese, it was only the geese who saved the inner sanctum if the stories are to be believed. But it's um, uh, they, they were the big bad guys in the north and the Romans were scared of them. Um, and one of the, the reasons they were scared of them is that they were culturally not very far behind at all. You know, you look at a lot of Roman uh, military terms for horse furniture, it all comes directly from the, from the, the, the Gallic language. You know, these were people, you look at, you look at the Lorica Hamata, the chain mail, that was a, you know, it was the Gauls who introduced the Romans to that. You look at the um, you look at the um, the Roman uh, gladius, you know, it was the Spanish who introduced them to that. The Romans were very good at appropriating other people's cultural ideas and mm -hmm. using them to their advantage because they they had the, um, the concept of discipline, which other people weren't quite as good at. Uh, but they also were prepared to wage war in a, in a merciless manner. 
Uh, and that was that's what really made the difference. You know, you fought wars with other people at the end of it. You had a treaty and you sacrificed some territory or gave them some money. You fought wars against Rome and at the end of it, they killed you all. Yeah. Um, or, <clears throat> or, or, or you, you got on board with the Rome, living the Roman dream, which in itself, as Tacitus has said, was actually slavery. So one of the things that we talked about before we came on is how barbarian the Romans are. Oh, very right. much so, yeah. yeah. Well, they, and the Romans are utterly barbarian at different times in various they they are. It's a very, very thin veneer of civilization. You know, as a culture, it would have been a horrific place to live. So one um, of the things that I think has really come across in just talking with you over the over the last few weeks, months, and certainly on, on this chat has been the depth of some of the work that you've been doing. I mean, one of the things I think, well, Mark Leeson has just asked it, I know, and somebody else asked earlier, is about putting together a book list or maybe things on Lard Island News that you just found really useful. I mean, there's obviously the various um, sources, the prime sources mm -hmm. translated, mm -hmm. but there may also be other things that, you know, people will be interested in picking up, I think, as a point of reference if they haven't already got that. I mean, I know that I certainly don't have uh, really books in the ancient period, uh, and so I'd be really interested to see what you'd use. Yeah, okay. I, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I, I mean, I have to say at the moment, I'm really full on uh, doing the layout and I've got to get that to print. That is very, you know, that's absolutely the key thing. Um, you know, we, the, I think so far the outlay has been about £30,000 and I don't really want to, I don't really want, I'm, I'm quite keen to, you know, not have that hole in my bank balance for very long. Lord, uh, I, that I was going to put you off publishing by writing a bibliography, Richard. Yeah, <laughs> but it might take time that I haven't got, but I will certainly put one together i have to say that the, the majority of the things that i've used have been primary sources prime sources and also um, academic papers i yeah. found to be a much better uh source of um, not so much information but they because frankly we, we've all got access to the same information as the academics or we have if we if we make the effort and look but um, they've been much more poignant in terms of giving me pause for thought and you know to literally just go away and sit and dwell and contemplate on that and make my own decisions. So there's a very big list of academic papers. Um, I spoke to Jasper Orthus, uh, the chief editor of Ancient Warfare magazine. He very kindly pointed me in the direction of um, uh, a big pile of academic papers. And I also subscribe to his magazine. If you are interested in Ancient Warfare, funnily enough, uh, Ancient Warfare magazine is a remarkably impressive magazine and has got a lot of very high quality writers in there uh, and lots of really, really good information. And in the way that WSS magazine have, you know, focus on Battle of the Bulge this month or whatever, they do a similar thing in terms of looking at one big issue like we do on the podcast and 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 really trying to nail that down. And I've been very impressed with that. But I also spoke to, you know, professors, um, universities such as Harry Sidebottom, and they provided me with um, and more academic papers and reading lists to go through as well. And so I've tended to focus on them. But there are quite a number of books that I've got here, which um, some of which were better than others. Um, but ultimately, what I've tried to do is use them uh, to cross reference with the, the the historical, archaeological, um, written information, uh, and then make my own decisions based on that, which potentially might be a bit arrogant of me, but I don't care. Very good. So possibly one of the, one of the other questions that was asked, and I think we've talked about it before, certainly I think Mike actually, Mike Hobbs, asked it on the chat tonight. What's, what's been the most difficult thing that you found in writing these rules? Um, getting this bloody thing to work tonight. <laughs> um, what's been the most difficult thing? Oh, my day as well. <laughs> no. Well, it's interesting actually. Um, ancient warfare is always problematic for a, um, a game designer because um, the emphasis is very different to almost um, you know any other period that we write about. Because the main emphasis of combat is close combat. Mm. That is where the decisions are made. So you really have to nail down all the facets of close combat which become far more important if i've got a group of uh, german infantry over here and you've got british there you move them to within four inches and we have a punch up you know you throw grenades i throw grenades we shoot at each other and then somebody wins and somebody loses in in a close combat based warfare you know that close combat's going to go on for a lot longer and exactly how those forces join or make contact 
is a lot more important. It's not it's not just move within four inches and then off we go. So you have to um, you have to really focus on getting that right. And the devil is in the detail there. Hopefully we've done that. Um, we do live in a world, unfortunately, where um, uh, some things that that you you would like to think are common sense. Um, you, you you actually have to try and cover every possible situation in explicit detail and you can't just say use your common sense and make your own mind up which somebody like Don Featherstone had the luxury of doing and I do look back and think bloody hell Don I wish I could get away with writing rules the way you, you wrote them much as I loved his, you loved his rules but nobody was, nobody was emailing him saying should that comma be a semicolon and if so does that change the emphasis <laughs> so uh, <coughs> as always the devil is in the detail with designing any game very good well i think that's probably all we've got time for tonight uh we're rolling up to nine o'clock we're always going to make it an hour we've gone an extra half an hour um mm. i think it's been great i think that's been really illuminating i hope everyone in the chat uh or who picks it up later will enjoy this uh, i certainly feel i've learned a lot more about ancient warfare talking to you about it over the last few weeks and months uh mm. this evening and I think there's a lot in the period which possibly a lot of people might not have realised was there, certainly in the smaller actions. So I think for speaking for all of us, it's a game that I'm going to be ordering and really looking forward to uh, and getting on the table and getting some figures painted. So my thanks to Richard tonight uh, and also to everyone for contacting us with their questions. Uh, Richard, anything else that you want to say at the end? Yeah, just that you've been marvellous, Sydney. It's been a, It's been a joy to work with you. I, I do try, but uh, <laughs> even with the technical hitch, that's high praise. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone on the chat. Um, and hope you have a very pleasant evening. And we look forward to seeing you on another live action. Good night. Good night.